Thank you, Bethan. So the aim of today's session is to provide an introductory overview for the what, why and for whom of an ICC service, an Inherited Cardiac Condition Service. We've got talks from a broad range of healthcare professionals and we're very fortunate to have a patient, Jo, who will be sharing her story with us. We're going to start our session today with Dr. Antonis Pantazis, who is the lead of the ICC service at Royal Brompton Hospital. With his extensive experience in developing and shaping services across London and also being the lead for the European Society of Cardiology's working group on myocardial and pericardial disease, there is no better person to deliver this talk on inherited cardiac condition services and their delivery. Thank you, Antonis. Thank you, Zoya. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for me to be here, but you said so many good things about me that you make me nervous now. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen. Right, I hope you can see my PowerPoint presentation. If not, shout. Uh, so in the next 15 minutes, I will try to give you an introduction and an overview into this introductory session about the inherited cardiac conditions. Mm. Right. Um, <clears throat> the inherited cardiac conditions is a group of conditions. It's not just one single condition, obviously, which may have a number of things in common, but of course they, they are different. And even within each one of those groups, there are significant differences. So. Um, I, will, I think we should focus on what is common in these conditions. And of course, uh, there is a different discussion about the individual uh, characteristics of each one of them. They're all inherited uh, as per the title of them. So they, they run in families. So important is to understand how they run in families. Always ask about the family. Always try to identify the pattern of inheritance even before we do any genetic testing from the family tree. The family tree is the most important uh, in piece of information in the inherited cardiovascular condition service. And it's a it's an ongoing process, actually, because uh, sometimes the information that we gather at the during the first consultation is populated by additional pieces of information that come in later. Uh, we can get information from other relatives which are added on respecting obviously always the confidentiality of each member of the family. We can get information from post-mortem reports from other hospitals, from hospitals abroad. It doesn't matter really where from any information, clinical or genetic, that it is related to the family and to the condition that we are investigating uh, counts and, and we need to collect it be, uh, in order to have the full picture. And of course, when we are talking about inherited conditions, and conditions running in the families, there are some genes behind them and some genes are responsible for them. We used to have a very simple, simplistic rather um, uh, approach and understanding of these conditions uh, a few years ago when we thought that ah, these are monogenic conditions. One gene leads to one disease and one disease is caused by one gene. Simple things and simple lines, but of course nature is, is, is not as simple as this and in actual fact is much more complex. And in reality, different genes can cause different conditions. And, and as you can see here, there are arrows crossing here in the middle because one gene can cause a number of different conditions and one condition can be caused by a number of different genes. And uh, uh, you may have the opportunity to um, hear more about it later today, uh, but, but um, the, the take home message from this uh, slide is that the, the relation between the gene and the phenotype is not as simple and we need to be prepared and uh, for everything and keep an open um, mind about it. And of course, this poses a number of challenges on the uh, genetic testing and the interpretation of the genetic testing, which is uh, probably the most challenging part of the test because uh, the genetic, the, the, the DNA is, is like a very big library. There are spelling mistakes uh, everywhere in the DNA, the truth is, and, and only a few of them, um, only a small number of them are responsible or can be responsible for clinical conditions. So the process of interpreting the results of genetic testing uh, 
is actually a science and, and it's, a, a, it's a, a long discussion, which is obviously beyond the scope of this presentation, but um, it's, it's clearly uh, the most important part of the genetic testing and not just to sequence the gene. And this information, as it um, comes together over the, the years, has introduced other um, concepts about these conditions. And one of them is the concept of having more genes involved in the uh, presentation of, of one uh, um, single condition, inherited condition. So we, we have started now talking about the polydenic influence, uh, uh, having uh, acknowledged and having um, identified a number of genes which um, can play a role in the in the phenotype and the, they don't all have the equal role in in the uh, generation of the phenotype but they certainly play a role and uh, the, this needs to be uh, identified and understood in in much more detail as as we are making progress in the research uh, of the inherited cardiac conditions and of course it's not just the genes there are other factors as well which i'll come back to them in a minute a simple way to have this genetic influence in mind and the genetic causes of these inherited condition, conditions in mind is this example which I have taken from uh, a, 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 some research on, on uh, the arithmogenic cardiomyopathy and the involvement of sports in the uh, development of arithmogenic cardiomyopathy, which shows that there may be a genetic predisposition, but there are also environmental factors. And there is a, at the end, there is a combination of all this. And if the combination reaches a threshold, then we may see the phenotype. If the combination of the genetic predisposition and influence and the environmental factors is not high enough to reach the threshold, then we don't have the phenotype. It's a, it's a very nice demonstration of how genes and environment work together. From a clinical point of view, uh, what tests do we do? We do uh, usually a lot of tests really because these conditions have multiple uh, and sometimes complex uh, expressions and I threw some words here just for the sake of the of the uh, discussion but essentially depending on the condition depending on the pretest probability depending on the reason why we are, we are uh, investigating the individual is it because of a presentation with symptoms is it because of a cardiac arrest is it because of family history depending on why we're investigating an individual, we will do different tests. And the tests range from uh, cardiac imaging, uh, different types of cardiac imaging. Uh, some of them, like the cardiac MRI, give us the uh, additional um, advantage of, of the tissue characterization. We can actually see inside the, the heart muscle and see what is in the muscle. Is there any fibrosis inside the muscle? Is there any inflammation? Um, we, we can do um, non-invasive tests, um, uh, which are usually uh, tests uh, monitoring and recording the, the rhythm of the heart. Uh, we can do provocation tests either with uh, pharmacological agents or with physiological maneuvers um, such as exercise. And at the very bottom of this slide, I put the, the missed diagnosis because it's an issue in, in inherited cardiac conditions, but it's, it's multifactorial if we want to discuss it briefly. The misdiagnosis can be the, the result of um, um, not knowing that, not suspecting that uh, an inherited cardiac condition may be uh, present. So if we don't think about an inherited cardiac condition, sometimes we don't find it. And that's a, a rule which is across many areas in, in medicine. Can be because uh, the, the um, infrastructure that in, uh, is available to investigate these conditions is not um, sophisticated enough, is not advanced enough, and therefore simple tests may not give us the, um, the right answer. Um, can also be because we haven't taken into account the family history because an individual's test results may not be diagnostic, but we, if we put them in the right context together with the family's uh, test results, then we may get the full picture. So many reasons for a missed diagnosis, and sometimes the missed diagnosis has consequences. Um, to add to all this complexity, uh, we have uh, recognized in, in the last few years that um, the, these conditions are not black and white. And, and why would they be? Why should they be? As I said earlier, nature is, is quite complex. 
and and doesn't do us the favor to to put things in in boxes. So we have recognized that dilated cardiomyopathy can start from a non-dilated phase, a hypokinetic maybe phase, where we don't really have the the, the typical markers for dilated cardiomyopathy, which is an enlarged heart. And um, now we also recognize non-hypertrophied hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and so on. Essentially, all these um, all this new terminology is aiming to make people aware of the very early stages of these conditions, pre-phenotypic as we used to call them before, which sometimes they, they, they are important. Um, they may be important because certain things could or should be done at that stage, but they're also important because sometimes they prompt further follow-up, which is uh, in the best interest of the patient. If we don't recognize the early stages, we may discharge the patient and this may not be the right thing to do. So it's increasingly important to understand the whole spectrum of these conditions and how they present from early stages. And after they present from an early stage, it's a long journey and this journey will take on board a number of factors, genetic factors, environmental factors, as I hinted earlier, and many other factors which will result in the phenotype, which can, the full phenotype of these conditions can be at any age, really. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised if people don't present with, inherited, with, with an inherited condition at a very young age and they present later. They may have signs of that, of the condition earlier, but the full phenotype can uh, manifest itself later. But it's a long journey and, and this is why we certainly consider these conditions as chronic. Studies have shown, and that's just another example of one of those conditions, the arrhythmogenic carnopathy again. Uh, studies have shown that if we follow the patients over a number of years, we will see changes in, in their phenotype. We expect the, these conditions to progress. Not all of them progress with the same rate. Not all of them progress in the same way. Not even conditions related to the same gene progress in the same way, given the multifactorial etiology uh, of them. Therefore, uh, we need to individualize this knowledge. We need to understand what is relevant to our patient, what is not. The patient, though, will obviously worry about symptoms and risk. Th this is the two main concerns of the patient. All the other um, science and, and research is for us to, to put in, in place. And symptoms can present um, in a number of different circumstances. Uh, we need to be uh, fully aware of what can cause symptoms, trigger symptoms, and what are the maybe everyday activities that could possibly prompt symptoms. Here's just examples of uh, daily activities like gardening, drinking some alcohol, going up the stairs, having food or, or being in a hot environment. These symptoms in one particular condition, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this case, and obstructive more particularly, uh, can cause uh, a, a number of symptoms and therefore we need to be aware not just of the condition and how it presents on cardiac imaging, but also of, of the circumstances that are associated with symptoms in the patient. Patients adapt to symptoms sometimes and the adaptation is obviously good because they prevent symptoms, but not always good because if a patient, for example, gives up all activities, all physical activities in order to prevent symptoms, this is not a good adaptation. On the other hand, if a patient has arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and is advised not to do competitive sports because the condition may deteriorate, that's the good adaptation. But we have to find the balance and advise the patient accordingly. We need to give them the right advice depending on their own condition and um, taking into account the information and knowledge that we have from uh, the research and the literature. The other problem beyond the symptoms is, is the risk. And some of these conditions are associated with risk of sudden death. And of course, when we try to pre pre predict first and then prevent the risk of sudden death, it's a big challenge because we essentially try to predict the future. A number of statistical algorithms have been uh, published and uh, none of them is perfect, but they all help um, in, in uh, stratifying the risk of the patient and taking the, the appropriate action, uh, giving the, the right information. We should always obviously keep an, uh, an open mind about the risk and it's something that we need to discuss with the patient as well, because a 5 or 10 percent risk of this or that, of, an, of a complication or even sudden death, is something that may or may not be important depending on the patient's approach to risk. Uh, what does 5 percent mean? It means 95 percent will be fine. 
But this is something that we need to have a very good discussion about, with the patient about the risk before we take any action, even preventative action. Now, the big one of the big questions in these conditions, which, as I said earlier, they're chronic, is how do we follow these patients up? It's a huge discussion. Of course, that would that could have been a, a topic of a very long discussion or lecture. Uh, but some issues related to that are that obviously um, we need to keep an eye on these patients because the, um, the, their condition may progress. But the data from the literature is very limited to advise us to give us an, a hint how often we should be seeing the patients, what exactly we should be doing every time we see them and whether a routine follow up appointment would be uh, actually good for them or we over medicalize them or we use resources of the healthcare system that could be used somewhere else. So there are a lot of questions about the follow up of these patients. Most of them are un unanswered because the, the way we usually follow these patients in the future is more or less empirical. Uh, we, we used to bring them back every year or so. But, but there is no strong evidence that, that this is the right thing for them. Maybe it would help if we separated the symptoms from the risk, because the risk is something that needs to be evaluated um, with uh, regular intervals, regardless of, of uh, what, how the patients feel, where the symptoms is something that uh, the patients can guide us uh, on. And in, in this particular area, uh, nowadays and with the technology on board, we are actually very keen to have a um, patient's feedback with uh, all the changes in their symptoms, which will be delivered to us using technology, which means that the, the, this feedback will be very direct and, and very accurate, and we will be building the patient's symptomatic profiles so that we actually know who needs to be seen and when and, and what is the right thing to do. If things don't go well, there are um, uh, measures of escalation for all these conditions, and this is just an example of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who was very symptomatic with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and had a surgical myectomy, which is an invasive procedure. It's an open heart surgery. Now, all this approach and the care of these patients is multidisciplinary. I don't say should be because it is multidisciplinary. In all cases, many uh, uh, specialties are involved and, and clearly more specialties than those on, on this slide. This is just a, a, an example for the sake of the discussion. And this is the right thing for, for these conditions. It is almost unacceptable these days not to uh, develop a multidisciplinary care. And I'm not talking about meetings, I'm talking about care, so that the patients benefit from the experience and uh, knowledge for all the relevant disciplines, because their condition may uh, develop in, in a way that all these or some of these disciplines are required uh, to be involved. Now, how do we put all these in some order? There are um, um, uh, pathways developed uh, and depending on the local resources, depending on the environment of the institution where the patients are seen, so that the patients are guided through a care system in a way that it is good for them and uses the resources in the best possible way. So we need to answer some questions. Again, some examples here. Are the patients referred for clinical reasons? Are they referred because of a genetic finding in the family? How do we follow up the symptoms? How do we do the risk assessment? How do we collect this data? Do we need to escalate the management? Do we need to discharge them, which is quite uh, infrequent uh, in, in uh, inherited carrier conditions? So all these are major markers and parameters that will determine the pathway that the patient should be on. And finally, the new kid in the block is the new treatments that work on the cause of these conditions. And this is now an example of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I'm showing you the sarcomere, which is the functional contractile unit of, of the myocyte, because um, medication which targets directly one of the proteins, which is responsible for the obstruction and the movement of the muscle in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, has been developed. So we are hopeful that in the future we will be giving to these patients uh, disease specific drugs, which will um, change not just their symptoms, but will also change the natural history of these uh, diseases. So we are going in uh, and we are very happy about it in the era of uh, personalized medicine, um, which depends on the exact cause of the condition. So I'll stop here. It's a, it's a brief overview anyway, and I, I have nothing else to say, but ICC is obviously a very uh, complex and special service 
which is delivered, has to be delivered, must be delivered in a patient and family centric way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Antonis. Thanks for a very interesting talk and overview of inherited cardiac conditions and nicely setting the tone for the rest of afternoon session. Um, while there's still time for a few chat um, questions to come through in the chat, please, please do write those in there. Um, I have a question for you, if that's OK. In your opinion, what are the key things to get right when planning and developing an inherited cardiac condition service? I think we need, one needs to balance a lot of things, really. Um, uh, the balance needs to be between uh, the clinical indication, the, the risk of the patient, take into account the age of the patient, uh, put the patient on the right pathway. As I said, if the patient is young or, or, or a child, they will start from a different point than uh, an adult. Um, we need to take into account and obviously provide some information and support for these things their um, um, professional activities or their plans to to um, to choose this or the other uh, occupation in the future. We need to take into account uh, their um, symptomatic status, not over medicalize them, but yeah. give them as much help as they need. Because sometimes, <coughs> let's be honest, sometimes doctors, we do things sometimes that please us and make, uh, make us feel more relaxed that we have done we pick the number of boxes, but this is not always and necessarily in the best interest of the patient. So no. this needs to be taken into account. So it has to be a very multidisciplinary service, uh, the ICC one, and, and has to cover all these areas. And of course, more than those areas that I can uh, explain in, in two minutes. <laughs> well, you did well. <laughs> um, thanks, Angela. So I've got another question. So as we're increasingly becoming aware of inherited cardiac conditions and diagnosing them, but also screening families, we have an increasing number of people that will be entering our services. How do you think that we plan or develop our services to be able to provide a good quality service, but to an increasing number of patients? Mm. Yes, I mean, very relevant question to uh, the previous one. I, I think we need to find ways to, first of all, use the available evidence to follow the patients based on available evidence, not overdo it uh, if, if there is no evidence, use the common sense sometimes, and most importantly, use the technology. Um, I think we are, I mean, in many areas, we are going into the uh, um, AI, artificial intelligence era, and I think we, use, we need to use artificial intelligence here as well. We need mm -hmm. to, to develop models that will benefit from the data that uh, the models will be fed with. If, if, if we get a lot of data and more particularly good quality data, this data will guide us what to do next. And I think this is the right way to do it create data sets, that, data sets that will allow us and enable us to follow the patients um, with um, uh, depending on what they have and not always follow them forever. It's a chronic disease. People live with this many decades. They sometimes have normal life expectancy, but this does not mean that we should be seeing them every year if they are diagnosed at the age of 16 to see them until the age of 96 every year. I mean, sometimes this is not really what the patients need. Mm -hmm. So rationalize all this and use the resources in the best possible way. Thank you. Um, we've actually got some questions coming in now through the chat. Um, one question coming here. Is it accurate to assume that with the current NHS structure that ICC services are likely to only remain in tertiary centres um, or may they expand out to being looked after across perhaps even primary and secondary care? That's a very good question indeed. Um, it is not good for the patients if ICC remains only in tertiary centres. Clearly, that restricts the access of the patients to good care. So what I think is ideal to, to, to have um, is, is a network, we can call it whatever we like, a network, a, a hub and spoke model, a type of model whereby the, the patients can be seen in a local hospital if they need advice from a tertiary center or from wherever else they can have it. We meet on Zoom or on our Teams now. Th this type of communication can also happen for uh, clinical purposes and we, it happens actually. There are meetings happening on Teams for, for clinical uh, discussion. 
and the patients therefore can be can stay uh, with the, the the local hospitals. Uh, the local hospital can develop services which are not particularly expensive and not particularly demanding, but will uh, serve uh, the, the basic needs of an ICC patient. And then anything else more advanced can be done in liaison with a tertiary center. And if at the end some of these patients need to be physically referred to the tertiary center, that's fine, but that should be the minority. So. I'm very much in favor of a, co of a model that uh, en enables and, and enhances the collaboration between tertiary and, and local centers. Yes, you're absolutely right. The hub and spoke um, model, which allows um, specialist services to provide um, advice on the very specialist um, questions that come up during a patient's care, but really making use of, of, all, the, um, of all the health and medical help that there is in the community and closer to that patient. And I guess it comes back to the importance of the MDT when, when um, considering setting up these kind of um, services. Right, well, Antonis, that was great. Um, thank you so much. We hope that you stick around for a bit later with the panel discussion.